Hello, everybody. Welcome to the workshop number 98, Who's in Charge? Accountability for Algorithms on Platforms. My name is Gonzalo Lopez Barajas. I work for Telefonica, so I'm a business representative. Uh, and uh, let me first introduce the panelists who will be conducting this session. Here on my left, I had uh, Fanny Hid Hidbegi. She's Access Now European Policy Manager based in Brussels, and she has a long time focus in privacy, where she has worked before on the EU US data transfer. She has participated in the fight against the national data retention law in Hungary and has promoted privacy in housing technologies. Now she also has a strong focus on artificial intelligence, so that's the reason why she's sharing this session with us. Now to my right, I have Philip Malok. He's vice president, uh, head of uh, group Polyfe policy, public, group po public affairs at Telia Company. He's also chairman of the executive board of EDNO, the European Telecom Networks Operators Association, who has more than 40 members and is uh, uh, based in Brussels and represents basically all telecom operators in Europe. Uh, we also have two panelists which actually are joining us a little bit later since they are coming from a different panel that uh, is not ended yet, but they will join us in brief. They are Lorena Jaume Palasi. Uh, she is a uh, founder of uh, NGO Algorithm Watch and has also now started a project uh, named Ethical Tech Society. She has just participated on the opening session, on the opening panel on emerging technologies uh, just early this morning. So where she had also a great contribution on around ethics of algorithms. And finally, we also have uh, Karen Rayleigh, who is the managing director of Tungsten Labs, building communication technology with privacy by design. Previously, she managed bare metal and cloud infrastructure in the private sector and work on information security and censorship synchronization for NGNOs. Now, uh, Christina Olauson, who has been coordinating this workshop, will go through the details and explain you how we are going to be working on this workshop in 1998. Please, Lorena. Uh, Great, thank you, Gonzalo. So, hi, everyone. I'm Christina from Ethno, one of the organizers of this session. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today. So, the setup is a bit different than a normal panel session. We would like to get you to interact more with the speakers and also up moving. So what we will do is we will divide the, the audience, you, in two groups. One will be on this side. So we'll have to ask you to maybe get up from your seats and move a bit closer to the speakers so you can all hear each other. And the other group will be on this side. Uh, so. I would say we can split somewhere here in the middle and please uh, feel free to get up and go to one of the corners so you can hear what the speakers say and you can interact with them. I hope that's fine for everyone. We will do that now for half an hour. Then we're going to come back and the speakers will uh, bring back the messages from your discussions here to the floor uh, in a discussion with Gonzalo, uh, our moderator, for 20 minutes. So, and I'm here if you have any questions, but for now, please go to the two sides of the room and we can start the breakout sessions. Thank you. Uh, Fanny is now on, on the left side and on the other, so please, please join them and come closer because otherwise it will be hard to have a discussion.
for those joining now, we are having two groups to do a discussion. So please come here to this side on to, or to the other side to join the different conversations. Come, well, you, you can stay here on this side. Sorry? No, no, they are the same discussion. Uh, well, it would not be the same. We, we, we would like not to be the same discussion, but I mean, they are addressing the same topics, the same questions, so it will depend on, on the different groups, but yes, it's, it's the same discussions.
Hello. We have time for one more question, intervention at each group, and then after that we will reconvene and, and to have the joint session. Hello. Once that you finish this intervention, please, we can all come together here where the speakers will have a, a present a brief summary on what their discussion has been about. And then we will have chance to, well, okay, one more minute. So, thanks a lot for your contribution to the breakouts. So now We'll give a minute for the speakers to, to organize what they are representing us as the, the results of the summary of the different breakouts. In the meantime, uh, if you could come a little bit closer or if you might want to move so that uh, we can have a, a lively debate afterwards. So basically now we will have the speakers uh, doing a brief summary, five minutes, presenting what was the discussion in their groups. And afterwards, um, we will have a lively debate among all of us to see how can we move this forward and what are the main messages. And of course, those that have uh, not been able to participate will have the chance 
to participate and, and so that we can have a more interactive uh, session. So, so we also have uh, the, on the online moderator. So we'll be, we will be bringing questions from, from WebEx, from online participants as well. And uh, we will just give uh, one more minute for the speakers to organize their, their summary, and then we, we will move forward. So, since Philip had uh, an easier job because he was, well, maybe more difficult, but he has not to, to agree with other one on his intervention, we will let him first to, to give a brief summary on, on the discussion on his breakout session, and then we will go with the other group. So, Philip, when you are ready. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. We had a very lively discussion over on our side of the, uh, the table there. Um, we, we, we broke the topic down into its three respective areas which came through in the questions. So we had a, uh, a, uh, an important opening session on, on kind of breaking down the problem. So what are we actually trying to address here when it comes to the issue? So um, we, we firstly got to the point of the question here is, 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 for example, how can we make this human to human process that is the creation of algorithms and the utilization of algorithms something that's really understandable for all those, those people involved? Um, we also uh, touched a little bit about on how can we reconcile transparency with people's intellectual property rights as well in the commercial space as we go forward. Um, there's also an important discussion which was, was very active, which I think crossed over all the discussions here, which is about, it's very actor dependent in many instances. So what will be the role if the actor will say a government actor, what is the role of a private sector actor and others. Um, and one notion we kept coming back to as well time and time again was this notion of purpose. So in terms of what is being done, and also who is doing the algorithms, for example, what's the purpose for that initial, the initiation of the process to, to utilize an algorithm, for example. Um, I think we came back on the transparency point as well. Uh, there was a very good point raised on, on how do we really work with the level of abstraction here? If you're incredibly transparent, do you get to a point where for the average citizen it becomes a completely non-understandable topic area? Yeah, if you go too far the other way and you're too vague, does it necessarily have the given impact that it's meant to do? Um, but having said that, we, we kind of got to the point that some disclosure is, is better than nothing and we, we really need to start, start somewhere. Um, there was a, a very, very interesting discussion which was raised by a few speakers here and we, and we kind of ex, uh, extrapolated on a little bit where we, we talked about the the potential of some kind of moratorium. So given the, the purpose of what you would potentially utilize AI for an algorithm, is there value in putting a moratorium on say, uh, uh, war situations, weapons, or other situations where uh, there's probably a relatively undeniable human, strong human element to the necessity of a decision? Um, But we're not starting from a blank slate either. I think everybody recognized that we do have in existing principles um, from uh, the UN guiding principles on human rights. Um, and how, how are we going to then uh, kind of extrapolate those out when it comes to uh, a future on AI and algorithms and others? Um, we also touch on the topic here really that the, the, the court system could well be the, the, the system which is best placed to act as an arbiter as we move forward on 
uh, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and also the, the, the overall idea here that there isn't a huge amount of value uh, in rushing to creating very prescriptive um, pieces of legislation, although there was some debate whether um, the, the interplay between concentration in markets and self-regulation lended itself to be a, a, a credible tool going forward. And so this is where we saw the discussion about how businesses and also the uh, competition elements come into play here. Um, so um, there's also a big question on jurisdiction, both geographical jurisdiction and institutional jurisdiction if you do choose to uh, move forward here. So how and in what fora and on what terms would you move to regulate in this area of AI and algorithms? Uh, we heard that the European Commission, for example, has already kick-started some work in this area. The European Union, of course, already has uh, a quite significant tranches of, of legislation when it comes to everything from telecom regulation to data privacy, data protection legislation. Uh, already, and, and is that a kind of formula going forward? Other fora mentioned uh, is, is the G7, for example, a correct place to have these kinds of discussions. Um, I mean, I think I'd sum it up generally that, that one notion that kept coming back onto the table was that, that, that trust really is a, a, a parameter which all actors need to value and will value whether that's from a commercial perspective or whether that's from a government perspective or whether that's from the perspective of those creating uh, AI and algorithms. But that's not to say that there's a free license. Um, there needs to be some level of oversight and how we get to that. Um, I think some people were, were, were quite clear that they prefer a process of iteration, um, that we confront challenges as they emerge. Um, but this is not something to say that, that, that problems aren't very real and problems can be very, very uh, strong when it comes to algorithms making errors and otherwise some examples of, of self-driving cars um, certainly doing that. So um, I'd probably leave it there as a summary. I'm sure there's about 50 points I missed, but um, I, I'm sure everybody will be willing to, to put their, their, their hands up when the time comes for a discussion. Thank you, Philip. Uh, now, so we can turn, I don't know who will be providing the summary. Uh, All three of us. Okay, so, uh, I don't know, Lorena, can you go, do you want to go first? Yes. Um, we started with, um, with the idea of explainability and what does it mean? And it seems that we have like different ideas of what explainability could be. So some participants were thinking about data, just understanding what type of data is being used is good enough as an explanation. There was also a conversation about, well, perhaps uh, you might also want to know the parameters and how they are being weighed in. Although that has a, um, of course, a, a specific impact if you do that on a public level, if the explanation is um, meant to be an explanation for everyone, because of course this means that you can game the system, that you can learn different alternatives, uh, how to fool um, the algorithms. Um, and um, I, there was, the discussion continued farther with, and, and I think we didn't reach a common agreement on that, but one of the many aspects um, that were mentioned as an explanation are things that are less concentrated on data and the system, but more on the output of the system. So does this system discriminate for which reasons? What are the reasons for discrimination or for classification? Which has a more slightly social um, approach to the explanation of an algorithm, and it's more concentrated on the social impact of algorithms. Um, and the, the conversation went back and forth on that, and I think this is a pretty good example to show that explainability is still one of the most discussed things that we need to understand, not only with regards of um, what is an explanation, but also with regards of um, the addressee, to whom uh, are we um, giving an explanation, and for which purpose is this explanation being given. And with that, I will uh, pass over to Karen that can uh, put more uh, insights into 
Yeah, we also talked about um, understanding the, the impact of, of the output of especially large data sets where you may not gather sensitive data, but you can infer things that become sensitive data with a large enough data set. And so explainability um, should also encompass what do you end up with at the end. And this is something that not even the, the engineers maybe understand at the outset, but the, the impacts can be, can be wide reaching and they can be uh, severe, especially if you bring in intersections of uh, health, race, gender, economic status, um, there are, are real world harms that have already been done as a result of data collected for seemingly innocuous purposes like targeted advertising. Um, and uh, finally, I will uh, report back a little bit about the, on the general data protection regulation, which unsurprisingly came up in the conversation. But let me start with thanking for all the participants to, to be open to um, address the challenges of, of the setup of, of the room. And I think we had a quite good conversation despite that. Um, so it came up a lot how data protection regulation is adequate or not um, to address some of these issues and we discussed the specificities of the relatively new EU data protection regulation um, which you might be familiar with and there's not a lot of differences between the former directive and the GDPR except for the really really huge fines and the whole enforcement piece but there's one big difference and that's actually related to explainability and, um, and uh, redress against automated decisions and it will pose a lot of challenges when we look at uh, the impact of artificial intelligence and algorithms on, on human rights because the redress mechanism which is to object to the decision is um, arguably only accessible when the, f the decision was fully automated and we had a conversation about how rare that is, that it's actually fully automated. Um, and, and that has also an explainability um, limitation, I would say. Uh, so that was one aspect. And finally, the other one was how, what's the difference between the personal data and the identifiable data itself, what the law protects, and insights and conclusions that companies or the private sector, anyone uh, can draw from that data set which might not be protected by the law and how in the future this could be a challenge for data protection authorities um, to, to have proper enforcement mechanisms. Okay, so this is a kind of experiment. We see that we have uh, some diverging approaches on the different groups. But so let's try to, to focus the debate, for example, on, on explainability and transparency, which are issues that have been addressed by both groups. Uh, on the one side, we had, for example, um, if we wanted to have all the information that was used to, to come out with the, the results, I recently read that in a, in, in, in a university, they, they did a, a, a case to basically explain the results of, of the works that were graded by different individuals. So they did, uh, they did use an algorithm to solve the bias of the different uh, per persons grading the, the, their, uh, their works. And basically at the end uh, they came out that when they were given full transparency on how this was uh, implemented basically some of the students that did not get the, the, the grade that they wanted, they did not really appreciate the transparency of the, of the process. So um, I don't know, um, what, the question here is, one of the issues that we were addressing is who is the transparency, who is the explainability going to be addressed to, who is that going to respond and, and are we ready to, to deal with the reasons or, or, or to deal with the response on why the, the, the algorithm has come up with that result? Any views on this? Well, I think 
that it's important to differentiate between transparency and explainability because an explanation it's um, it's a different thing an explanation is a reconstruction um, it's always a justification um, whereas transparency is, uh, is, is it's, it does not try to justify anything um, and of course both when when it comes to transparency and both to um, it comes to explanation it's always a subjective point um, who is giving transparency to what which which factors are being used to provide transparency to whom um, transparency to a developer is nothing uh, it, it's, it's it's a different story that transparency to a policymaker it's a different story to transparency to a user um, and uh, it, it always depends on the purpose of transparency. So you want to have an insight on what specific factor of the technology. And of course, you're right, there's this ambivalence in the technology. Um, all things AI, all things machine learning are very good at pattern recognition. So of course, when we human beings discriminate, we leave a pattern in our behavior. And you can, with that technology, you can have a better insight on the ways human beings discriminate. So it's, uh, it, it's a, th there are two dimensions to this technology. On the one side, you can amplify your own bias by coding uh, and by using data in such a way that without noticing, you are using a technology to discriminate. But on the other side, you can use that technology to learn more about the human nature and how human beings discriminate to each other. And this technology might be very helpful to show you in how subtle, subtle the way is in which we human beings are, are biased without noticing, even without wanting. Um, and th th that is, by the way, a good potential of this type of technology. From a monitoring perspective, having algorithms that look at things from an architectonical point of view and look how institutions um, behave towards different types of gender, different types of um, culture, ethnicity, um, religious uh, believings and all this stuff, that can give a lot of insight how the public administration uh, um, is going forward when it comes to people that want to access to social security or, or access to specific um, services. And the same goes for um, the private sector. So um, I, I think it's important that we address that there's that ambivalence that on, the, on the one side, um, and it, well, Sorry, just to recapitulate, I think we human beings, because we are doing that technology, are just showing that we can create bias and discrimination on many different levels. And that might show in the technology, but that technology might help us understand back how we um, can learn from ourselves and um, be more consistent and less discriminative. So funny. Yeah, and um, there's one component we haven't really talked about, which could, which should be the basis of the transparency requirement, especially in the pri in the public sector use. We didn't talk about transparency around contracting and public procurement, and just the most basic uh, requirements to disclose uh, by governments when they use an AI system, and what companies they uh, contracted for, and how that was developed, and who manages it. Um, and one, for instance, there's one example which is really, really not well known, but the Hungarian government, maybe six, seven years ago, started a pilot project in Budapest, in the capital city, in one district which is, um, is known to be uh, populated by a r lot of Roma residents, and they started a facial recognition uh, pilot project there. Um, and they put the whole project under the operations of the National Security Service to avoid any transparency and access to information laws and requirements that they would have to disclose. So nobody knows what's going on and what they use the information for, but we have evidence that there's a discriminatory um, fining and sentencing, sentencing practice on the basis of the perception of someone being a Roma person in Hungary. I would say the, the issue of transparency, you can have fully open source code 
You can have access to all the academic papers that led to the algorithm. On a technical basis, everything can be 100% free and open. But the more important data to assess the impact will come from the communities that are impacted by discrimination in, in AI. A community that is disproportionately affected by predictive policing, the people in those communities know what discrimination looks like. And they should be believed when they say, this is discrimination. And the, the bad part uh, where they say, okay, this, is, this, is, um, this contract is secret for national security purposes or something like that, and we can't show you the algorithms, we can't show you any of these things. Um, you don't even have to get into that. Just believe people when they say bad things are happening as a result of this technology. So it seems that, that we have two different approaches that, that was commented previously on that group. It's one is related to the role of governments regarding transparency, and also it was commented that maybe business had a different role or different responsibility. And that, that is that because of the impact that they have on the society of what they are doing? Is that how could that be implemented? And also, it was mentioned before uh, intellectual property, so uh, that. Uh, uh, it could not be provided full transparency of the algorithms because businesses, for, for businesses, there was an, an intellectual property uh, associated with the algorithm. So uh, is, is the role of governments and businesses the same regarding transparency? And what has uh, intellectual property to do with it? Just a quick comment before. I, I would not underplay the role of private sector in human rights violations and, and the impact on our life. So I, I'm not sure I would uh, differentiate between the responsibilities in that sense. But of course, there's, a, we, there's an existing human rights framework globally and regionally that's applicable to state actors, but there's also the UN guiding principle which is applicable to the private sector. So the respect and the protection and promotion of human rights in my view should be equally applicable to, to all actors. I think it's it's important from a legal perspective to make a difference between private sector and public sector, right? And because of a good democratic reason for that. That's right. Um, but of course, um, when we talk about accountability, accountability is in many cultures not a legal concept. It's an economic, it's a private sector concept, by the way. Um, and uh, there's a huge a difference between what the US means legally when they talk about accountability and what is meant in Europe when we talk about accountability. There's the first, the very first time we've ever enshrined this concept in law is with the GDPR and it's a problematic concept because um, from an ethical perspective accountability makes a lot of sense but from a legal perspective, making sure that uh, proving that you have not done something wrong in advance is a weird way to proceed legally. So um, I think we need to, separ to, make, to, make, to be clear uh, when we talk about accountability, whether we are talking about it from, from an ethical perspective or from a legal perspective, and be also clear that accountability means in many different legal cultures different things. Now, going back to the concept from an ethical perspective, um, I think that it, it, it depends very much on the context, that you cannot say as a general rule, company have less stakes, um, less higher stakes than, um, than governments. If we take a look at with Facebook and how Facebook ha operated in Myanmar and Bangladesh with the Rohingya, um, it, it was a very problematic situation where a company was helping government to, um, to, 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 to operate in such a way that we had a genocide. Um, and it's, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's a, an easy situation to decide because if you're a company there operating in a country that is an autocracy um, and you need to decide, I am, do I keep providing the system? Do I need to abide by the law of the country? Or uh, if I do not, um, by which law do I abide? Or which, which type of ethics do I abide? And um, how do I operate in such a way that is both legal but also legitimate? It's not an easy issue and I want, uh, 
I, I wouldn't say that um, companies are per se uh, devils that only want profit. That's not true, and I don't believe that. I see a lot of companies that have lots of engineers and people working there that want to just shape and operate with the future. But, um, but I think that it's important to have an ethical conversation about that. I think that when we talk to, uh, when we talk about with companies about uh, what do we mean with accountability, but also what do we want from you as a company to be accountable for, companies are still thinking that they want to have um, the ethical feedback from society, and that's good, that's important. But a company should also create their own ethical profiles, their own virtue ethics, and say, we're a company that has decided to have this specific ethical profile. This is our understanding from ethics. And it, they also have to come up to this conversation because ethics is a whole societal conversation. And it's not only civil society that should be having the conversation, but also the companies within there. And this also means to show your inner um, virtues as a company or show your inner ethical principles. And I think I haven't seen many companies saying that. I see many companies that say, oh, we do this partnership with Facebook and Google and so on and um, pledge to follow the human rights. Um, but that is a simple commitment. That is not an explanation of who you are as a company and what are the values you stand for. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, and I think hopefully it shows the commitment of private sector and business that we put forward this topic to be discussed today and arrange these types of debates around this topic. So it's equally a pressing topic, and, I'd, and, and I, I agree that a multi-stakeholder environment of these debates is absolutely pressing for both business and uh, all stakeholders. I just point to a couple of examples of ETNO members who've... Um, published publicly um, uh, their own take on some of these ethical standards. So Telefonica to my left, I know very recently published uh, uh, their guidelines or uh, principles towards AI as well. Uh, another tele Etno member, Deutsche Telekom, published last week, for example, uh, a, a, a document which is now open for public scrutiny. So I, 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 I think that you probably will find, I mean, the European Commission, for example, has gathered its expert group on AI, also I think involves a, a, a rather broad cross-section of both stakeholders from civil society, government, business, and otherwise. So I, I think there is work going on there. Is it perfect? Probably not. Uh, is it work in progress? Absolutely. Just to build on that, because I'm part of the expert group for the European Commission, uh, just to be clear, it's around six, seven percent civil society, more than 60 business and the rest is academia. So it's definitely not a proportionate representation of stakeholders. And uh, I, I agree that there's a role for ethics frameworks and I'm not questioning that, but I think we have to be very careful because there's also a tendency to develop these principles to avoid compliance and there are existing human rights frameworks that should and can be applied in the first place. And then on top of that, there can and should come the ethics, uh, ethics and principles. And just one example for that, Google published its AI principles and it has an interesting section on red lines uh, when AI should not be developed and uh, deployed. And one, uh, one human rights implication that they mention is it's a red line when the intention is to harm human rights, but they don't mention that should be a red line when the impact is uh, violating human rights. I think there's an intervention. Thank you. My name is Charlotte Altenhöhner from the Council of Europe. I wanted to just point in this context to an initiative at the Council of Europe to develop through work in an interdisciplinary expert committee, which is uh, government, private uh, companies, and civil society, independent experts, really, to develop recommendations to member states on how to address the human rights impacts uh, from the deployment of algorithmic systems, and to do that through two different um, lines of work, really. One is to make very clear what the obligations of member states are, what do they need to demand and what do they need to ensure in order to um, comply with their own human rights obligations when it comes to safety and security from algorithmic systems, when it comes to data quality, 
when it comes to transparency and contestability, also when it comes to effective remedies, and then at the same time also to make very clear what standards private companies and private actors engaged in the design, deployment, development of algorithmic systems, what they should do. And the purpose very much is um, to go beyond ethics. Ethics are wonderful and ethics are important to promote trust. But maybe at this point we do not just need trust, we also need trustworthiness. We need um, people to actually be able to rely. We need possibly more auditability, more clear standards in terms of also for companies so that they understand what they should do and what um, also through what type of innovation can be incentivized to to address uh, inequality in a way such as Lorena mentioned, um, rather than uh, reinforcing inequality, et cetera. So this is an initiative that is ongoing. It's a longer term um, acti uh, activity and we are hoping to adopt recommendations uh, in, at, uh, in early 2020, I'm afraid. So we're working on this now. We will have public consultations over the summer. We want this to be a very open process. And uh, we will then have uh, politically binding, at least, um, standards for member states and for companies. Thank you. We could try to see if there is any intervention from online participation or no? Okay. So um, since, since ethics is not enough and maybe uh, recommendations are needed, maybe this goes to, to uh, another, could go another section about regulation. So, is regulation needed? You talk at regulation on two sides. Here you mentioned GDPR, here you mentioned competition law. I don't know if maybe you could elaborate more on, on how this, this regulation could be applied to, to, the, to the algorithms or what, what you're referring exactly. Uh, I'll do my best, but I'd encourage people who were part of our discussion who are far more qualified than I am to, to intervene at this point. I, I, I think the, the, the point we got to was that, um, you know, ultimately responsibility is responsibility, and, the, and the, the choice of technology you use to fulfill an action, be that through AI or others, there is still a human element to the initiation of a process. Um, and so I think that leads to some level of accountability. Um, hopefully, uh, one, one, one thing we w I, I would personally point to on regulation, and, and I'm, we have many people from the Brussels Fora here for, from uh, discussions, the only issue you have with regulation is it tends to be uh, painfully slow. Um, and, I, and that's why I enjoyed the, the, one of the points made here about working in an iterative way if we can. Um, and so I think there's, the, there's some value in exploring as much as this technology is going to revolutionize society around us, uh, hopefully it gives us a little bit of a free reign and a scope to try and interpret ways in which to manage a policy process that's probably slightly more innovative than the one we've had uh, for, for a very long time. Um, what that looks like in its entirety, I'm not exactly sure, um, but, but hopefully we, 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 can, we can think a little bit more laterally and so we don't kind of uh, stamp on a nascent technology too early. Yeah. Uh, first, I, I just wanted to say that I think it's sometimes painfully slow and sometimes it's painfully fast. For instance, the European Commission right now is considering a law on terrorist content regulation and that's going to be passed before the elections because there's a political impetus to pass it and whenever, whenever they don't want then it's, it's, of course, it's painfully slow. But on regulation, I, I already talked about this report to this part of the room, but I wanted to mention that Access Now just published a comparative report on all the EU member states' proposals and strategies that are already publicly available, and some, reg uh, some of the regulatory ones from regional bodies. And one interesting overarching theme in all of them is that it's too soon to regulate AI as a whole. Uh, at the same time, uh, all of them acknowledge that we have existing legislative frameworks that are applicable to artificial intelligence. And the, the, the very interesting thing is when we mentioned this to the European Commission that, that we're doing this scoping and mapping exercise, they got extremely excited because they had that they don't have that overview 
what all the member states are doing, which I think is quite um, interesting. Um, and what Access Now is arguing for is a human rights-based approach uh, instead of an ethics-based approach for all the member states. And we understand that there might not be a need for an EI regulation on the European level, but there's definitely a need for a harmonized approach to do it, to avoid a patchwork, a patchwork of regulations and different types of exceptions and rules and sandboxing. And I would be really curious to hear where Spain is at in the process. Uh, just one super quick point, which I think maybe fits into this conversation. It seems like we've, we've, we've jumped down a very European path, which I think is often the, the case we, we, we do in general. One of the points really raised in this discussion is how do you create some kind of global international context and comparability across the board there? And so, and which fora do you choose for that, essentially? Is it this fora? Is it some other G7 or, or whatever? So what does that look like to make sure it isn't a, a kind of global patchwork? Hmm. I'm a bit, I'm a bit always concerned about the concept of harmonization because it sounds so good, harmonization. Um, but in the very end, what we have is some sort of um, legal text that is common to, and it's always a minimal common denominator. It's not the maximum that you get. It's always the minimal common denominator in the first place. But on the second, that you have a legal text does not imply that you're going to have the same legal interpretation of the text. And we see that already within the European Union with 27 memberships and very different interpretations from Spain to uh, going over Germany until Hungary. Um, that's the first thing. So I, I'm sort of a bit cautious because sometimes I think it's good and it's important to acknowledge the legal culture and the political expectations of the specific legal culture all around the world. And one of the things that, um, that we never discuss, we discuss always the US hegemony over the export of technology, but we're not discussing the European Union hegemony over legal, over legal exports. We are exporting and enshrining our law to other regions of the world that are very interested in having commercial exchange and therefore are bending their own legal cultures and tradition to just have adequacy in order to be able to cooperate economically with the European Union. And that is not right either. Um, so, so I'm, I'm concerned about this type of approaches. Uh, I like the approach of the Council of Europe because it's open to many other countries from other continents and it's a possibility to enter a conversation and it gives you, but still, it always gives you a minimal common denominator and I think it's good to have variety of law, to have just um, a form to accommodate the different cultural expectations about law. Um, but what I think, I would totally agree with, um, with Access Now, is that right now there's many, many issues with this technology which we don't know exactly um, what the real conflicts are. We don't know how and how far this technology is creating path dependency in human behavior. We don't know that. We don't know much about the factors in technology that lead human beings to believe in the software or not believe. We don't know um, under which circumstances a specific forms of discrimination are happening. And in many legal cultures, which are very individualistic, because from the law dogmatic point of view, democracies are really individualistic. They only understand individuals. They go by an individual rights approach. Um, they are having legal struggles that they are addressing, in my opinion, wrongly. Why? Because this technology is not about individuals. This technology is about collectives. It's about creating infrastructure. And with that, you, we are seeing already many effects on a collective level where we see that the specific types of collectives are being treated differently than other collectives, but no individual harm. So there is no way to redress that. And there's no way to prove on an individual level and to sense in an individual level that there is a specific impact on individual's life that is not legitimate. So this type of challenges are one of the things where democracies from the Western countries can learn a lot about um, 
countries from other regions that are less individualistic and have a more societal approach, more collective approach to society. And this is one of the things that I would like to see addressed in this type of fora where we learn from others, where, where we Westerners learn from other societies, what is their take on how do they apply these technologies? What is their fairness um, idea at that collectivistic level? What is their um, collective rights approach? This, there's been a whole conversation on collective rights um, coming from the Global South, um, being always addressed at the UN level, at the UN level has always been very cautious on trying to address that issue because we thought that with human rights it's enough. But this technology is showing that no, it's not enough. Okay, so we have time for a final intervention for all the speakers, so you can make it brief. So uh, we could have uh, Fanny, for example, if, or, okay, do, um, Karen, please. So whatever regulations um, come into play, and this has been touched on by the other speakers, uh, the things I would like to see are consultations from the people affected. Um, if you are making medical technologies, if you're doing medical research on a given population, people with a specific disorder, you should ask them where they can be discriminated against. How has data collected about them being used in, in the past currently because there may be some ongoing harms. If you're using a system such as Centrelink in Australia, the, the robo-debt, there are already systems that are being used to deny uh, benefits to single parents, to people with disabilities, and they have resulted in people going without insulin and dying. They've resulted in suicides because of people losing benefits. Then in that case, the, the regulation should be swift. The program should be stopped. Once people start dying, the program should be stopped. That should be regulated somehow. And when it comes to people from other countries, the fact that Silicon Valley is companies like Facebook are debating, should we hold ourselves accountable for facilitating genocides, should tell us all that Silicon Valley should not be the arbiter of social good with technology. They failed. They need to step back and listen. And so whatever regulations come into play, one founding principle should be nothing about us without us. The people making decisions about technology, the people coding the technology, should look like and think like the people being affected. I would make two final um, conclusions. One of them is absolutely not new, but we almost had no technology experts in the room, at least ours. And it's really not a new demand to have lawyers, policymakers, affected communities, and tech, tech people in the same room. But I think that this specific conversation really needs them to be, to be involved. That's one. The second is uh, to connect to what you just said. I think um, lots of the tech companies are complaining now that all the policymakers and lawmakers are looking at them to solve all the issues, but for the last 10 years or even more, they've been feeding that line to all these lawmakers that technology will solve it all. So now we see how the, how the failures happened and I think we need to act swiftly to stop those uh, failures and violations. And finally, um, even if it's not enough as a starting point, at the moment for AI, it would already be a really huge gain if we had a basic understanding of human rights-based approach for AI that it must be respected and this should not be a question for any stakeholders. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to discuss the where's and what falls and moralistic values of things, I don't think, because I don't think I'm as well placed as the other speakers. But uh, I, I, I'd maybe just try and bring a note of positivity that there is also an enormous amount of opportunity that lays in this technology. There is a huge amount of potential in solving some of the big questions that are out there from a global context. 
If you look across the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the increasing use of technological innovation and digitalization lies as a key enabler for all the solutions put out there. It's not to undermine the fact that there is significant questions, but I think it's also pertinent for us to bear in mind that the opportunities out there are also incredibly great. And if we don't embrace those opportunities, we may be doing ourselves somewhat of a disservice. Okay, uh, we're coming to an end. Just to wrap up, uh, basically, we have been discussing on transparency and, and explainability, which are different issues. We also commented on the role of governments and businesses uh, relating human rights, with both of them being affected and being part of, of, of the, the equation. Uh, regarding regulation, we mentioned that it is too early to, to regulate uh, so that we do not ham uh, hamper innovation. But uh, at the same time, uh, we, we have seen that in our, uh, all any, any mechanism that starts uh, discussing the regulation or, or, or codes of eth ethics or has to imply and to count with the persons being affected by it. And, and to finalize, I would just like to end with a positive note on all the possibilities that, uh, that artificial intelligence and algorithms are, are bringing us. Thank you very much for, for your attendance and thank you for all, all the speakers.